Yet, here's the thing is that as, as different as we are, I believe we're much more similar than we are different foundationally. Similarly, similarities, just like again, these kids at the orphanage, you know, feeling safe and seen and loved, feeling appreciated, right? Is such a powerful, powerful human need. Mm. Every human you know has a need to feel appreciated. And when they feel seen and appreciated and corporate study after corporate study was they study what keeps people happy at an office or a team culture or a company is money is never number one. It, it's partly, I mean, it's in the top 10. You need to have a competitive wage. But what makes how people feel happy at a company or happy in a marriage or happy in a friendship or want to go the extra mile for you is when people feel appreciated. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am super stoked to be joined by the one and only Tiffany Peterson. Tiffany, just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Oh, Nick, I'm so looking forward to this. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no doubt. Um, When we met about a month and a half ago now, I was like, this girl is just different. This girl is like connecting with everybody like they are best friends of 10 to 20 years and like creating relationships and connections with people like immediately some of the people that you had already met before some people you had never met before but like I immediately was like oh my gosh this person like cares for me and this person like wants to get to know me and so that definitely drew me to you like right away so I'm super excited to get your energy and other people's ears and, and other people's eyes and everything like that so they can feel that from you as well but the way I want to start today is going a little bit into kind of like your career trajectory and some of the different pivots that you've made because I always find it fascinating when people change jobs and change careers and change industries because I know often people find themselves stuck kind of in the same thing and they almost feel like they're hopeless and they can't really pivot or anything. So I know you started kind of as a special education teacher working with children who had disabilities and challenges and you thought you were going to be a teacher uh, and a mom and you were never going to be a businesswoman. But then you get into this career where you worked for really popular brands like Stephen Covey at Franklin Covey with a, with a book. Uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, with Robert Kiyosaki, with Rich Dad Poor Dad, with Chicken Soup for the Soul, Jack Canfield, and you really helped to kind of build those brands, and you really helped uh, as a sales team kind of build that. So I want to start off by talking about that transition, and then I want to kind of talk about the transition after that that you've since made with like becoming more of a speaker and everything like that. So talk to us about the transition that you originally made from kind of that school teacher into the role in kind of the more of the corporate world, if you will. Mm -hmm. I love this conversation because I think we can all relate to that in some way or some form or fashion, our lives paths and whether that's, you know, personally or professionally can look different than the way we plan them to be. And how much, like when people ask me, like, how did you get on the path you're on? I'm like, well, ultimately I'd say God, right? And not everyone uses that language, but universe or this knowing as well, a combination of like, trust the flow of life, trust your heart, trust God. Because sometimes my, the desire I had, you know, as a, as a young woman, I, I really was drawn to education as I thought, as you mentioned, I thought I'd be a traditional educator and was going to school for that. Why I was an aide in classrooms to the special needs teacher. I've always had a spot, soft spot for whatever reason for kids with special needs and, you know, different challenges. And I loved being part of that. And by happenstance, I went on a double date in college, right? One of those coincidental meetings. And the woman and the other couple, her dad owned a training development company and they were doing business to business training, coaching and teamwork and leadership skills. And they were doing that for corporate companies. and. I just remember feeling this draw and I love, sometimes I'll say that is honor the draw. I felt this draw. You know how sometimes you meet someone just like when you and I met, I was like, I love this guy's energy, right? Or you, you meeting your girlfriend or me meeting my sweetheart or, or someone tells you about a book that you go, oh my gosh, I just feel drawn to that. Mm -hmm. And then you end up reading it and it puts some new idea in your brain and just honoring the draw. And so I honored the draw and interviewed with them a few months later and 
then changed to your point, the trajectory of my career. And I went to work for this training development company. And from there, Franklin Covey and Rich Dad, Poor Dad and Jack Canfield and so forth. But that initial crossover really, again, was this happenstance meeting, which at the time felt like no big deal. I'm just on a double date at a restaurant with another couple. And then by that way, that relationship, you know, and connection evolved and going to work for them, it really just opened up so many doors. And so sometimes there's this undercurrent or flow in your life that maybe knows bigger or greater than you. It's kind of like a river. Mm. You just kind of have to, if you surrender to that flow and the draw and you just be open, you have that kind of a mindset. You just never know who you're going to meet, what's going to happen. Just like us, when I got in the room that you and I met in from meeting a woman backstage at an event in 2020, a woman named Amberly Lago, and we just had an instant connection. And then she and I nurtured that friendship and I introduced her to some people and she's introduced me and and then she invited me out to speak at her event and there we met, you know, and you just, and how then I got in the room, I met her, you know, it's always through connections. Mm-hmm. And so it's just being open to that. And then, yeah, it just, I, I, ne- I didn't think I was going to be on stages and I didn't have this big idea to like, oh, I want to run a business. It was, I, I had a teacher heart though, Nick, and that is the same. So even mm-hmm. though the classroom changed, the outside changed and the way it formed itself, the heartbeat is the same where I had this desire to help teach kiddos how to have greater self-confidence, how to have skills and tools to expand themselves and to grow. And that is the same thing I'm up to in the world. It just changed. Same heartbeat, different costumes, so to speak. And so, as you mentioned, I went on to work for Stephen Covey and and I was never going to be in sales. Like how many of you listening ever thought in a million years you'd be in sales? I didn't. I thought I was going to be a school teacher and then get married, be a stay-at-home mom and raise babies and sew Halloween costumes. And like, no, I, at one point I ended up putting my dog in a Halloween costume. I became a person that I absolutely had judged before I did that, right? Like, <laughs> come on, guys. Like, it's an animal. We're not putting it in an outfit. And then I did it. That's <laughs> Airport hilarious. judge, right? And so- but then as I, I went to work for Franklin Covey, had some great sales success and really learned how to connect with people, really learned how to sell and did so well selling, they asked me to start training classes. And that put me the beginning stages on the path of being a sales trainer. It was a corporate trainer for a few years for that company eventually and fell madly in love with that because similar to the education heartbeat. It was now training classes on mindset and communication and sales and goals. And then in 2009, my life went through a lot of change, right? A lot of shakeup. I went through a health diagnosis and a shakedown, a reorganization at my company and my corporate six-figure gig went away at the same time I was treating an early cancer to getting, you know, in a serious relationship and moving my home. It was like so much change in about 60 days and life, the universe kicked me out of the nest, my comfort zone of corporate America. And I took a severance package and started my little business, not knowing what I was doing in terms of running a business, but I knew how to connect with people and people are always your business. So with time, Mm -hmm. business got you know, footing under it and started that technically in 2010, the beginning January of 2010 is formed my company and been working on my own since and self-employed and have a small team that helps me run my platform and my world and just really love what we're up to and what we're creating. And it's taken different variations over the years, but that's kind of the core heartbeat. And it's still, it's, it's evolving or different things or ways but the heartbeat shows up again and again is the same. Mm. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. There are so many different things I want to kind of point out and allow people to really digest for themselves. I think the first one is kind of going back to that double date that you had at the restaurant is like, oftentimes I think we go into scenarios when we think it's just a really casual scenario. And sometimes we close ourselves off. Sometimes we are not all that open to conversation. We think like, oh, this is going to be a lousy date. Like I'm tired. I kind of just want to go home. Like you walk in the restaurant thinking like, how quickly can I get out of here type of thing? But it's like, no, like always have your heart be open to the possibilities to any situation because you never know where it might take you. You know, you already mentioned a number of the different like 
small scenarios that have changed the trajectory of your life. And I think we always need to be open to that. Um, I love what you said, like honor the draw. I think that's such a powerful, easy phrase for people to remember that everybody can relate to. Honor the draw, that thing that's kind of pulling you towards it, honor it and explore it a little bit. And then lastly is being okay with pivoting how you think, how you originally planned for things to go. Like I really believe that in order to get closer to the best version of ourselves, we need to start with having a vision and we want to have an idea of where we go and then we got to start on that route. However, we can't be so married to that end vision that we are not open to other potential possibilities for maybe getting there, right? That's like why a vision needs to not necessarily always be so, 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 so specific with the long term. It kind of needs to be a little bit more general. Like I want to be t- a teacher hearted person in my career. It needs to be more kind of like value based because then you realize that there are a lot of different avenues that can lead you to that same scent, that same like sense of value that you're providing. I thought that was such a massive key to kind of some of the things that you've done. Mm-hmm. Well, when I think about pivoting, we all have had experience now it, with all of us at some level or another when we lived through 2020, right? And whether people had to pivot massively or minorly, we got to experience that as a collective whole and our various experiences with it of like, whoa, the world's doing this very different thing and what's real, what's not real, what's fact, what isn't. And, you know, this thing and that thing and live events, like where I met you, obviously got shelved for a while. I watched, you know, my speaking calendar fall apart in about three days and uh, quite a bit of revenue fall off my calendar, you know, but I also thankfully I've been coaching and doing a lot of online groups and webinars for years. And, but all of us got to pivot in that time frame, and there were challenges in that time frame, and there were huge blessings in that time frame. Mm-hmm. And I think that it matters that we know that no matter the path we're on, there will be sweetness and there will be gems and there will be challenges. And that's true for any of our paths. And I think knowing that too is we can embrace that. But there is something, I think part of just everything we've already been sharing today is, you know, we don't always give this enough credit, but really, truly trusting your intuition. It's been said that your intuition is your guardian angel, right? And that we call it the gut. We talk, sometimes we call it the Holy Spirit, our intuition. To me, they all kind of merge together in that same space where it, it's spiritual. It's not just me. It's a connection relationship there. But it's opening up to that and honoring the draw and trusting that life, God, source, universe has your best interest in mind and helping you grow. Because sometimes we resist growth, right? Sometimes we love our comfort, little comfort zone, but a lot of times your comfort zone is a version of playing small. And so when you think about like leaning into your best life, your best self and, and more of who you are, more of like Nick contributing to the planet, Tiff contributing to the planet. And that doesn't always mean in this big grandiose way, but it is going to be, you know, you're going to be invited to grow again and again and again. And I'm grateful for that. Truthfully, before the pandemic, I mean, I don't really love to admit this, but I also believe in being a truth truth teller is success can make you really lazy. Mm. It really can, you know? We get, we call it comfort or complacent in relationship, right? Versus how you show up in the beginning of a relationship sometimes. And, you know, but in my business life, I'd created a lot of success and it was a lot of everything was a lot of rinse and repeat. Right. And I'll tell you, you know, that shakedown and so forth. And I really love being with people. Like you said, thank you. That's a huge compliment. Like when you said you're backstage, like, meeting everyone, like becoming their best friend and some you knew and some you didn't is I really, I just, I just love people. And I don't, that doesn't mean sometimes I need a break from people and I need to rest and like unplug and like do my introvert thing. But I generally love people and I love connecting. And one of the things I think that was hard for all of us, all humans, however you identify as extroverted or introverted or personality type, you know, the lack of being in person with one another was really challenging. And I remember, I'll tell you this, that I remember in the fall of 2020, and I was at a very small gathering, like maybe 10 people. And this woman was playing a video of herself. And she'd been a speaker at a previous event of mine and using some B-roll footage in her 
you know, video she was sharing. And I saw my stage and saw her on it. And I started to cry, you know, and I remember in that moment, I had this feeling and this awareness and this prayer where I just said, you know, God, I will never take that for granted again Mm -hmm. because I'm just owning it. I'd kind of gotten lazy. I wasn't really growing and creating anything new. I just was rinsing and repeating a lot and reaping the benefits and loving that. And there's, that's not wrong, but it's truth telling that sometimes change, it wakes us up where we're more awake, we're more alive. We're more, you know, like that. I love that energy of my first year or two of being an entrepreneur and starting my business and that grit and that hustle and that heart racing at times of like, I really got to show up to have this work. And then when, you know, 10 years in, you're super successful, you get hit with a pandemic, you know, it's like I'd gotten kind of comfortable and some, in some ways lazy. So yeah, a good wake up for me. We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first I wanted to share some words from a participant of the 10 week transformation. At Best U, we started running the 10 WT back in January of 2020 and have since had 313 people and counting go through it. They've seen their bodies get stronger than ever before. They've seen the stubborn fat finally come off, and they've seen their habits dramatically improve. And honestly, more than anything, they've seen their self-confidence skyrocket. If you want to learn more about the 10-week transformation, then you can go to nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. That's nickcarrier.com slash the number 10WT. We'll get back to the show in just a second, but first, here's what they had to say. Hi, um, so I completed Nick's 10 week best you transformation. And I can't say enough about my experience, but I was looking for something to help me be more accountable and to just develop overall better habits. And I wanted to make sure that I was getting that strength training in because I think that was one of my weak points was not consistently getting strength training. The groups, the people in the groups are all different shapes and sizes. I felt very comfortable right away. It's a very supportive environment. Nick uh, is great at bringing you in, at kind of meeting you where you're at. The workouts are so thoughtful. He's so good at creating a balanced workout. So if you go two times a week or three times a week, you can be sure that you're getting, you know, you're working all of your muscle groups. I definitely got way stronger throughout that 30 weeks. And I feel much stronger now than I did when I started. I feel more confident in my ability to execute on those exercises. And like I said, I I can't say enough. Nick is so good at what he does and I think it's it's only getting better. So you are in excellent hands with him. No, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think that that is one of the most common things that people who are pretty darn successful can get in the rut in of like my habits are working for me. I can rinse and repeat this stuff and and things are going to continue to be good. And like you said, it's not necessarily wrong. However, it does stagnate growth. Like it stagnates you from becoming another version of yourself that you have the potential to become. And so like the people listening to this podcast, like if things are good right now and things are rinsing and repeating and your habits have always been the same and you're, and you're pretty comfortable, like know that it's not wrong, but know that you can take it to another level if you step into something that requires you to make either a massive or a minor pivot in what in, in, in whatever direction to, to provide you with growth. The other thing that I wanted uh, to bring up and kind of talk to you more about is you said back in 2009 you were going through a tough time in your life where you were uh, diagnosed with an illness your job uh, you got released from your job um, you were going in a, in a relationship and to kind of give you a little bit of insight into my mind and how I visualize life is I, I break my life down into six different areas our health personal, career, financial, spiritual, and relational. And I believe that we need to be managing all of those at any given point in time. And if we can manage all of those and have solid like foundational habits and just solid foundational things in all of those, then things are going to be going overall pretty well in our lives. You, you mentioned a time when essentially three of those and potentially more were a little bit in chaos, right? Like health, was a little bit in chaos. Your career was a little bit in chaos. Your relationship was maybe a little bit in chaos as well. And therefore, like your whole life seemed a little bit 
chaotic. And, and I think a lot of people find themselves there. And so finally, the question is, how do you go from a point of having chaos in multiple areas of your life to being able to get back to a place of sturdiness, a place of foundation that you can kind of finally feel like your head is back on top of your, on your shoulders. Mm. I want to answer this with two different perspectives and they both, again, they meet. It's not either or it's and. First of all, faith is a, a big part of my life and I respect however people connect to this area or what that means. One of my dear friends would say, you don't have to know the outcome of all these different scenarios in your life. You just need to know the knower. Mm. Meaning spending time being in connection and presence with God. And, and that really helped me through that time. Cause you know, I was 33 being diagnosed with cancer and that was, you know, pretty healthy. And it was a huge sphere. I mean, that's a big word, right? Like you go, Whoa, okay. You get, it's a big wake up call and all this change in my work life at this within a short amount of time after that. And There was just in moving my home and there was so much change in a short amount of time, but my faith really is, is my root system. And so prayer, and there was actually what looking back now felt like probably an odd amount, but just perfect amount of peace was around me too, was just kind of like, whoa, everything's kind of up in the air. I'm not sure. But for me, the gift of just my own spiritual walk and spending time with the things that nourish you. And even if some of you might not identify as spiritual or even believe in a God, you can choose to believe in this life force, the same life force that's growing your fingernails, is growing the trees, is bringing back the tulips. That same life force is in your growth favor. Mm -hmm. And so however you identify, because I respect truly that there's lots of languages and titles, I just think we're talking often about the same energy. And so trusting in that, that I was being held, I was being supported and walked through that season. My faith was a big part of that. And secondly, when, when life is more, I think this all the time, and this is where you and I have some similar, you know, connection is I'm a big believer in self-care. I'm a big believer in moving your body every day, big believer of like nourishing your brain, you know, listening to good shows like this one, reading good things, putting good fuel in your body, but that you take care of the vessel. And especially when life is stressful or there's chaos, there's loss, there's a move, there's a change afoot, really important to also rest, get rooted in your rituals, right? So I'm talking about being rooted in your faith, but also rooted in your rituals where that does give you a sense of stability. And that is that you can control that even if you're healing up from a big health thing or an injury right? That perhaps maybe you're not like getting after it in a big workout, but you get out on a walk, you know, and you get into your meditation practice or your yoga stretches and poses, and you're doing the things, those self-care habits that really help give you root and your rituals that put you back into like, okay, I feel better. Is you're going to be more clear-minded likely, you're likely going to sleep better, which you definitely need, especially in chaotic times. I mean, we need good sleep all the time. So these are not things Hopefully these are things we do regularly, but especially when you're like, wait, my heart's broken right now. Any of you listening or, you know, I just got fired or this major thing happened in my life and you're feeling topsy-turvy, you're feeling uncertain is spending time doing the things that nourish you, movement, mindset, you know, nutrition, all those things that enrich your life, they deposit in you are really wise to do. And then naturally, I think we're able to to navigate better what we're up to. Doesn't mean that mm-hmm. sometimes you are going through something that there's deep grief. And yeah. even when you're doing your self-care, you're still going to feel the feels. We're not trying to have you bypass that, but right. it's just the awareness of like taking better care of yourself is always going to help you navigate seasons of uncertainty and stress. Yeah, no doubt. I'm I'm glad you went here because I, I want to continue to stay on this path just a little bit further because I think that is one of the biggest struggles of people who are servant-hearted or teacher-hearted, right, is you want to put other people first. You know, we were taught that being selfless is a great thing and an admirable thing to be, and it is, but a lot of people just, I think, approach it necessarily kind of a wrong way, right? Like you got to start, like you said, 
taking care of yourself and taking care of the vessel so that you have something to pour out of. And, and I know my mom has told me one of the most important things that she did when she had us three kids was like she had a treadmill right next to her bed and she made sure she hopped on that thing like every morning before we got up so that she could fill her cup before she had to you know serve us and do the things that we had to do as kids. And there's a lot of moms that listen to this podcast. I, I train a lot of moms uh, in, in my fitness program and this is something that we're constantly talking about. It's like prioritizing time for yourself first so that you have the ability to give back. And I know that you talk a lot about helping people overcome the mom guilt of, I feel bad if I'm not doing something for my kids and I'm doing something for myself. So I want you to just kind of riff on that idea of people who are experiencing that guilt of, if what if I put myself first, am I not doing the right thing and, and kind of how to overcome that? Mm, I'm so glad you're, we're going to touch on this and that you do work with lots of moms and those of you listening, but moms or dads. And I think that it's the mindset shift that many times people, to your point, they might feel guilty. They think, you know, self-care is selfish, right? It's taking time away from other people. And while I understand why people could think that thought, it actually, I want to reverse, not just say that self-care is good, but on, I want to go to the other side of the spectrum that self-care is actually quite spiritual. Not only is it not selfish, it's actually one of the most spiritual practices you could be doing. And let me ask you just to think of it this way. You heard me probably share this when we met in Raleigh, that I asked or shared with the audience there that I'm a big fan of basic math, right? Basic math, really easy to follow. And basic math in this conversation is when you feel better, do you show up better? And yes. that's basic math. And the answer for everyone listening is yes. You have more patience in your parenting. You're more likely to be kind, serving, generous. You're more likely to give people grace or extend or whatnot or reach out. When you feel better, you're going to show up as your highest, best self. And isn't that what God or universe would want? more often. And none of us show up with our highest, best self all the time. So just be clear. No, we're not talking about being perfect at that, but actually you feeling better puts you in a higher vibrational state. And therefore you think better thoughts, you feel better. You're more kind. Kindness in every religion is, is taught, right? And even if you're not religious, it's like I had a post go up Sunday that said, kindness is God's currency. And I had just gotten back from a trip to an orphanage in Mexico where I was last week. We took a group of 40 volunteers, mostly teens and tweens, to an orphanage there to serve there and play with the kids and do projects on site. And there was a moment where I just burst into tears. I've been on this trip a few times now. I love this organization, a group called A Child's Hope. They support 10 orphanages in Mexico. And my husband and I take these trips. He's been doing them for years, which is partly why I was drawn to him and we were dating and falling in love was like, wait, you're handsome and you want to help the orphans. You know, it was like, mm -hmm. you're a unicorn. But anyway, on this trip, you know, every child at the orphanage is speaking fluent Spanish. Some of them understand a few English words. And some of the people on our trip could speak fluent Spanish, but most people couldn't speak much Spanish. So you have a quote, a language barrier, mm -hmm. but you never have a kindness barrier. Mm -hmm. Right. And watching these yeah. little kids connect with each other that can't speak the same language, but they're playing, kicking a soccer ball around and smiling and laughing and hugging each other. I just burst into tears because it's that reminder of the human spirit and the human love and connection. So why I say this is, again, self-care is when you feel better, you show up better. You're kinder. Therefore, to me, that makes it actually quite spiritual. Plus, like when you take care of some people use the language, your body is a temple. When you take care of yourself, I think that those are sacred acts mm. and you deserve to feel better. End of story, right? I used to make it about, oh, self-care because then for everyone else, well, yes, that's a natural byproduct, but it's actually is just because you exist, you deserve to feel better. But definitely realizing that your relationship with you sets the tone for every other relationship that you have. And so the more that you deposit in you mentally, emotionally, physically, some of the best things I do for my partnership is actually me taking better care of myself, mm -hmm. doing my emotional cleansing work when my emotions and 
doing my self-soothing work and moving my body and, you know, helping myself feel good, feel better. I'm a much better girlfriend, wife, partner. By the way, that's all with the same man. We just call each other like forever boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, kind of thing. (laughs) But it's true. It's like, sometimes it's like, Hey babe, I need a night off. I need to really kind of take better care of myself. I'm fried and I'm going to go to yoga or do a hot soak or, you know, things like that, but I'm regularly doing my own self-care. And it's actually one of the kindest things I do for our partnership. Mm. Isn't yeah, that a unique way to see it? It's, it's oh my different. gosh, such a unique way to see it. And, you know, I, um, I feel like I probably heard you say that on stage, but I, I'd forgotten that, that self-care is spiritual. I think that's such a great way to see it in the sense that the two things that you said, I feel like that falls under that umbrella, right? Is it when you take care of yourself, you show up kinder and that's how God would actually want you to show up, number one. And then number two, like tr- thinking of, you know, we hear our body as a temple. And so taking care of that temple is also kind of a, a spiritual practice as well. And then I loved how you said that your relationship with you, with you sets the tone for every other relationship that you have. And I feel like that is so massively true. Like if you don't truly love yourself, you are not going to be able to maximally pour out love for others. If you don't maximally take care of yourself, you're not going to be in the position to be able to take care of others to to the nth degree that you possibly can. And so I, I love that your relationship with yourself sets the tone with every other relationship that you have. Now I want to get down to two more questions. Uh, before I ask the last one, uh, you know, I mentioned right at the beginning about how I feel like you're such you're so great with relationships and connecting with people and and everything like that. I want to get practical a little bit with relationships. I know it's not always science. I think it's a little bit more art most of the time with relationships, but to give you kind of two examples, two prompts, one of the things I used to do was coach at Orange Theory Fitness and I would teach a lot of classes and there's a lot of people coming in and out of the doors and I was always really big on wanting to know everybody's names. And so I knew that when I was meeting somebody for the first time and I had them in my class, I wanted to say their name three times within a span of like five to 10 minutes. And if I could say their name three times within a span of like five to 10 minutes, then it was ingrained into my brain. And then for another example, I actually just met with a friend of mine who's who's a business guy and he showed me how he goes out to eat to restaurants a lot. And he has like a contact in every single one of his friends uh, in his phone for different restaurants that he goes to with names of like bartenders, names of waiters and waitresses and like beard or, you know, something to remember them by so that when he goes back, he can remember that person's name. And so those are kind of two practical things that, you know, a small thing I've done, something that he's done that helps really cultivate meaningful connection and relationships. And so I was wondering, is there anything practical that you feel like you do well so that you can kind of sustain good relationships. Yeah, I love that. And I think I'm a big fan of the word intention, right? Over your life, your relationships, your business, your health, all of it. And I think when you show up in relationship and and some of these practices, that's exactly what they are. Practices, they're an intentional practice. Mm. It's not about doing it perfectly. But I think when we just remember years and years ago, I'd heard this this sharing by Mary Kay Ash, the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics, who was a huge trailblazer in the direct sales world, which changed the game for a lot of, especially women to have an at-home business. While some of them, you know, again, were having families and children and so forth, but wanting that possibility of doing their own thing. And now there's lots of network marketing or direct sales companies out there as well. But she would say this, and this applies to all kinds of people and all kinds of business. And she would say, imagine as if everyone you meet has a sign around their neck and that sign says, do I matter to you? Mm. And all humans, as different as we are, right? Our genders, our ages, our, our tastes in clothing or music or flavors of food, like what we're about, where we live, there, we do have differences, the way we vote, the way we might worship or believe. Yet here's the thing is that as, as different as we are, I believe we're much more similar than we are different foundationally. Similarly, similarities, just like, again, these kids at the orphanage, you know, feeling safe and seen and loved, feeling appreciated, right? Is such a powerful, powerful human need. Every human, you know, has a need to feel appreciated. And when they feel seen and appreciated and 
corporate study after corporate study was they study what keeps people happy at an office or a team culture or a company is money is never number one. It, it's partly, I mean, it's in the top 10. You need to have a competitive wage. But what makes help people feel happy at a company or happy in a marriage or happy in a friendship or want to go the extra mile for you is when people feel appreciated. Mm. Right. It's so, it sounds so simple, but the simplest thing, like remembering someone's name, like your friend modeled and saying thank you or writing a thank you note or sending that thank you text. Right. Like, hey, I so appreciate you for being in my life, whether it's your friend, your sweetheart, your spouse, your client, is humans have the same similar needs. And so when we remember that, that no matter what we sell, some of you are in real estate, some of you are in health and wellness, some of you are in education or work for a nonprofit or for profit or whatever you're up to in the world. But we what we all have in common is we're all in the people business. And how people feel in our presence is our true business card. And so the more that we just work to like see someone, these are little nuances, making that eye contact and asking a question. And, you know, when people are asked questions and we're curious about them, those are major deposits. You know, as we mentioned, I worked for Stephen Covey in my corporate days. I'm so grateful and feel so blessed by that. And his powerful, well-known book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he's talking about studying seven habits of highly effective people. Habit number five, the most requested habit to be taught again and again in corporate training was seek first to understand before you're understood. And that's so valuable in sales. That's so valuable at dinner tonight with your sweetheart or when working through things or your friendships, you know, is seeking to understand, asking better questions or asking questions at all. Like, how are you and how can I best support you? And what do you need from me right now? And what's life like for you? And Whether you've known someone for a few minutes, you know, you're meeting at a new gathering to you've known for years, it's that, that need of feeling you feel seen, heard, valued, appreciated. Again, they're not usually really big things. You can definitely do the things where you send the gift baskets and the, the things that are favorites and go have amazing experiences. There's a great book and YouTube or Ted talk out there called the experience economy. It's phenomenal for relationship building. And you can absolutely do, with the, you know, again, create experiences for clients and friends and so forth. But I just think the more that we turn that intention back on is I want my person or this client or this stranger or my child or my friend to feel seen and important to me. I'm going to bring my presence. I'm going to be more aware of that matched with perhaps asking a few more questions. Basics. Yeah, but when, we rinse, when we practice those and those become more second nature, you really grow and develop your capacity to influence relationship because foundationally what's happening is you're meeting a core psychological need. Someone, if they feel seen by you and valued by you, you're now gaining trust. You're now, which trust is everything, the relationship longevity or to sales. And so those little nuances go a really long way in nourishing and building relationship. Mm, man, that's... Wow, that was so good. I mean, meeting a core psychological need, that just understanding and that realization, I feel like makes all of us treat our relationships that much more importantly. And it's just a constant reminder because I know, you know, me personally, it's not like I'm I'm pretty darn good with it, but there are plenty of times where I don't do that. And that that idea or that quote of imagining, ever, imagining everyone has a sign around their neck that says, do I matter to you? I'm like, oh my God. Gosh, like that is a powerful reminder and thing to always keep top of mind anytime you're meeting somebody, no matter if you think you're meeting them for five minutes or they're going to be part of your life for the next five years. Like that's absolutely massive. And I love the the quote that you have of how how people feel in our presence is our true business card. That's that's so good. That's so good. Um, well, Tiff, before I ask the last question, I just want to acknowledge you for one back when you were younger being open and honoring the draw and being okay with the pivot that you made in your career and and the whole trajectory of it. Cause I know it wasn't the vision that you originally had for yourself, but you stay, you stayed rooted in the fact that you were teacher hearted and the, the fact that you wanted to serve people and that allowed you to navigate your career in a way that's blossomed. So, so many amazing things. And it's just so cool to, 
to hear about and now be able to know you a little bit better and watch it actually, um, watch the true evidence of it and the proof of it. Mm -hmm. Friend, thank you. Thank you for saying that. And thank you again for having me. It's such a joy to be with you. Of course, of course. Well, I know you guys are going to want to go follow Tiffany and, and learn more about her. So make sure you go to uh, follow her on Instagram at Tiff Peterson. And then you can also go to her website at TiffanySpeaks.com. Uh, and she also has her own podcast as well, Tiffany Peterson Podcast. And uh, man, she has just amazing things to say. So I know you've got a lot from today and are going to want to go learn from more from her. So is there any other good way that people should go uh, connect with you and learn more about you? Those are the main ones. I would say my website, TiffanySpeaks.com, has several free resources. Specifically, there's a tab titled that, free resources. Go download my goals program, download the self-care guide, download the reading list. There's just lots of good freebies there that will help enrich your brain and enrich your life. And so mm -hmm. there are social media, of course, you've already listed those off. But yes, those are great ways to get connected. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, last question here, Tiffany, is I, I think getting closer to the best version of yourself is a constant journey and a unique journey. I don't think that we ever reach the best version of ourself. And I also think that the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is a little bit different than the way that you're going to get closer to the best version of yourself. So this last question is for you personally. If you could currently do or work on three things to get closer to the best version of Tiffany Peterson that you could possibly be, and what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Mm. I'd say the first one that comes to mind is be more committed to my evening ritual, the way I put myself to bed. I'm dialed with a morning ritual, have been for years, right? Where every morning I wake with some kind of prayer, nourishment, meditation, move my body. I don't necessarily do all those things, but I start with something nourishing every morning before I start my day on my cell phone or my technology or work or things like that. And just as powerful as so there's times I'm really good at, you know, intentionally winding down my day and going to bed. And then there's sometimes I'm not, and I'm on my phone till the last minute and then turn over to go to sleep. But I want to dial in my evening ritual, right? That'd be number one. Number two is I would say I need to eat more greens. I'm just going with my intuition. It's like, yeah, I love I'm it. eating some greens, Nick. I am, but my nutrition and my own wellness in that way is just eating more uh, greens, veggies, things like that, and being better about that piece. And then finally, the third one is that I just create more space in my calendar for just open spaciousness, right? There's a woman that I met earlier this year at a different event who she talks about how having space, having less sometimes is more, right? She calls it the less effect. A woman named Samantha Joy, great book. And just having more spaciousness where I can just have some downtime and quiet time, right? Where I'm not always, whether it's working on something and whether it's a house thing or a business thing or going to the next gathering or, or something like that is I really love just having some open time where if I want to read or I want to garden or I want to just kind of do having more space, I think would be actually a way to help me improve. Mm, I love it. Those are three phenomenal things, three really good things. Um, I hope you guys took some notes. I hope you guys are walking away with some takeaways. I know that for me personally, like honor the draw is going to be something that I constantly try to keep top of mind and being open into different situations that I go into. Number two, self-care is spiritual. Like the mindset shift of visualizing it that way and realizing it is that way, I think is super, is super powerful. And then the constant reminder of imagine everyone you meet has a sign around their neck that says, do I matter to you? And just see how that shifts the way that you treat that person and that you appreciate that person. So Tiffany, awesome stuff today. I really appreciate you joining me. That's all we got. Mm, thank you so much for having me. What a joy.